The omnis are God's non-communicable attributes. What that means is like mercy. Mercy is a communicable attribute of God. He gave us mercy. We're able to present mercy in the fact that we are image bearers, right? We are able, we have love. It's a communicable attribute of God. God has a lot of communicable attributes that he has given to us in creation, right? But the omnis, okay, they're uncommunicable. They are not communicable. No one here is omnipresent. If you are, raise your hand. I want to see it. Show me how. None of y'all are omni, omniscient, right? None of y'all are all-knowing. If, I, uh, if y'all are, I want to go to every competition where I got to count the, the beans in a jar because I need some money. And you most definitely are not omnipotent. You are not all-powerful. That one is supreme to me. To realize that God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He literally spoke everything into existence with his word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He said, let there be light, and there was light. The past few weeks, we've kind of gone through some of those communicable attributes. Even, Even wrath, to a degree, is a communicable attribute of God from last week. Y'all, have y'all ever had just anger? I'm sure at some point you've had just anger. Sometimes most anger that y'all have presented has probably been massively unjust, but it is definitely a communicable attribute of God. But again, the omnis are not. Turning your Bibles to Psalm, come on, I'm going to start at verse 1 and read through, I think, 10. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there was... There is a word on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before, and you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your hand will lay hold of me. I'm going to keep going just two more verses. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even in the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is is bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. And those few verses declare all three omnis. You have searched me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. God knows everything about you. Turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Jesus is telling of God's great love. He's proclaiming it. God knows everything. Not that God has counted every hair on your head. 
but he has numbered them. He declares how many hairs you have and how many hairs you don't have. He declares how many hairs have fallen from your head. He declares how many will go away. He knows every grain of sand on every seashore. He knows every molecule. He knows everything. God is omniscient. That, that word omni, it, it only means all. That, that's, it's the Latin derivative of a Greek word. It means all or every. He knows every bit of knowledge, all knowledge. There is nothing that he can learn. There is nothing new that can pop up. There is nothing that can surprise God. That includes Jesus too. It's not just the Father. Jesus is omniscient. He declares it many times in the Gospels. He knew their thoughts of their hearts. Y'all, a few weeks back, learning the Trinity. Y'all went through the Trinity. The youth went through the Trinity. Is there any attribute of God that Jesus doesn't have? No. Now, there was a time that he suppressed those attributes where he did not use all of those attributes. Like, for example, when, when the disciples ask when the end of time is going to be, when all this stuff's going to happen, he says, it's not for me to know. It's only for the Father to know. He suppressed it for a purpose. But Jesus has every single attribute that the Father has. And same goes with the Holy Spirit. Every single attribute. They are all all all-knowing. They know not just what you have done, what you will do, but they know every thought. And all these attributes, as we go through them, uh, we're like, what's the purpose? I mean, does it... Why does it matter that we know whether God is omniscient? Why does it matter whether we know that God is omnipotent, all-powerful? Why does it matter? He just is, right? No, to study his attributes, to know him better, especially omniscience and omnipresence, it helps us resist sin. Can you imagine having a friend right beside you all the time, physically, tied to your hip? And not only can he see everything that you do, but he knows every thought that you've ever had. God is that friend. Jesus is that friend. The Holy Spirit is that friend. They are with you all the time. You cannot escape it. There's even a misconception about omnipresence, right? Go to, uh, go back to Psalm 139 real quick. I'm going to read 7 through 10 real quick. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. What is Sheol? Youth kids, what's Sheol? That's right. It can reference three different things. Grave, hell, or Abraham's bosom, right? Is hell a place where we escape God? Nope. We are in the presence, if we go there, we are in the presence of the wrath of God, the justice of God. We're just absent from his loving attributes. We would be absent from mercy of any sort. We would be absent 
from love of any sort. We would not be absent from his glory. We would not be absent from his wrath. But we would be present with God. Go over to, and to prove that, go over to Revelation 19. Then I heard, I'm going to verse 6. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of, the mi- of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Oh, this is not the verse I wanted. Let me see. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory. Yes, it is. Okay. It's all the way down to nine. I'm sorry. All right. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the lamb has come. And his bride has made himself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the linen, for the fine linen is the righteousness, righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. No, this isn't it. Eh, I wrote the wrong verse down. Oh well, it happens to the best of us. I think it's probably nine. Let me go look real quick. Maybe nine six. My dyslexia gets the best of me all the time. Ask the youth kids. It happens to me continuously. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's nine. No, it's not. Give me two seconds. I will find it so I can prove my point. <laughs> I keep breathing into this. Where is it? I'm trying not to. I'm going to move it down and I'll find it real quick. Seven. We got time. It is. It's six sixteen. Scoot over. <laughs> Nines and sixes. Thank you, dyslexia. Okay. Six verse sixteen. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus. The wrath of the lamb. Jesus is punishing the same way that God punishes in the Old Testament. It's no difference. His presence will, is everywhere all the time. And Jesus' wrath is being poured out. Again, it really is. It, it's one of those things that, that it brings fear to us. Because we honest, I mean, we know, we know how messed up we all are. I mean, even, even now that we are, are born again, right? As I look at all y'all, I'm, I mean, I'm, I grew up knowing most all y'all. We all just stink. We're all wretched, wicked human beings. Our thought patterns, when we're not dwelling continuously on who Jesus is in his presence, that he's with us, that he knows everything, we slip. We slip hard. We do really dumb things. Our mouths, our thoughts, everything goes way over there. It's that, it's that uh, description like Paul talks about the dead man that we have to be constantly pushing it away because it rots our flesh, right? Well, dwelling on the attribute of God that he is omniscient and omnipresent helps us push that dead man off. Go over to uh, my favorite book of the Bible. 
Go to Job 34, verse 21. For his eyes are upon the ways of men, and he sees all his steps. There is no darkness or deep shadow where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. For he does not need to consider a man further that he should go before God in judgment. He knows everything. And even, even after being born again, but still, I mean, we know our sins are washed as far as the east is from the west. Right? And how far is that? Real far. Right? It's a point that never touches. But he sees everything I do. He sees every, every angry thought, every lustful thought, every sinful thought. And it grieves him. It, it, it's, it's one of those things that I, I, you know, it's realizing as a Christian that even those lustful thoughts or those those angry thoughts or or those prideful thoughts every single one is another spit in Jesus's face why he's hanging on the cross and I'm looking at it with his nails through his wrist and his feet How wretched are we? And how good is he to to have done it? Because again, Isaiah 53 verse 10. It pleased God to pour the full cup of his wrath upon him. And the same reason Jesus was able to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God took every bit of that sin. Every bit of it. Even those that that don't believe, right? First John two two, he's the propitiation for not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. He took all of it, knowing all everybody's thoughts, not just us that believe. God knew every thought for all creation, for all time. He doesn't learn anything new. He knew all this was going to happen. And he still set the perfect plan. He crucified Jesus before the foundation of the earth, as Hebrews says. I love you, legend. He knows all of that. And he still knows and cares about every hair on your head, as Matthew, as Matthew 19, 26 says. Go to Hebrews 4, real quick, verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. He knows all things, so what do we do about it? What do we do about it? What is it? And confess. We confess to him. He's a great high priest. Even though he knows all things, he still paid for everything. It's, it's the imagery that probably one of my favorite books that I ever went through with the youth kids on Sunday morning was Leviticus. And most of them, except for Isaiah, loved it. <laughs> they did. Because breaking it down and seeing Jesus in all, all of the, the law how he fulfilled all of it, right? 
But one of the images that I think everyone misses if they don't read Leviticus is the sacrificial imagery of the high priest, the lamb, that, that, whole, that whole system. If you don't understand that, you don't understand who Jesus is. Hebrews breaks it down the fact that he is our priest, our prophet, our king. He's all of it. He did it all. Well, in that, something that just eats you alive when you can, when you can picture it is the fact that when someone would have to bring a sacrifice for their sin to the priest, it wasn't the priest that had to do the slaughtering. That was on the Day of Atonement. But for individual sins, they had to take their hand upon a lamb that they're bringing to sacrifice. They put their hand on that animal's head to symbolize every bit of the sin that they possess is going upon that animal. And they would take the knife and they would have to slit that animal's throat and watch it bleed out. And Hebrews is painting this picture of Jesus being that lamb and Jesus being that priest And Jesus being that God, accepting it, he's all of it together. He knows your thought pattern. He knows your action. He knows it all. And he still accepted the pain, the wrath, the suffering for it all. Even though you... The only way for you to be saved is you to literally, literally, in your heart, place your hand upon the one true lamb. Taking all, everything that you've done, and you're going, okay, Jesus did it. Jesus took it all. He knows everything I think about. He knows everything I've ever done and everything I will do. And still, he chose to take it all. We serve a, a massively loving God. The other omni, right? So we, we've kind of talked about two very specific omnis. We talked about omniscience, really pretty, pretty heavy. That one, that one gets me pretty heavy. And omnipresence. What about omnipotency, right? All power. Go over, since we're still in Job, go to Job 11. Oh, we're not in Job. We're in Hebrews. Go back to Job. Y'all knew what I meant. Go over to verse 7. Can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? They are as high as the heavens. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and border and border than the sea. Broader. Thank you, Isaiah. That's why I had y'all sit up front so you could correct me. Appreciate it. What does omni mean? All. What does potency mean? Or power. God is the measure of power. There, there, is, no, there is no understanding of, of power outside of God. A mental picture that I hold to all the time, there's this book, it's called Odes of a tilt the world And this guy pretty much goes through and describes the immense power of God in reality. And he does it in really, like, mentally graphic imagery. It's, it's pretty awesome. But to realize that we are on a planet spinning about 2,000 miles per hour, and we don't get flung off. A couple... 
hundred, what is it, a couple million miles from the sun that, you know, we should be burned up by, to be completely honest. If we are any further, if we're, near, you know, everything's held perfectly together. Every molecule placed in its right position. And that he just said, let there be light. What's your favorite cookie, Isaiah? What's your favorite cookie? Oatmeal. All right. how, how can you get an oatmeal cookie? Can you make it? Okay. You, can, you can use a lot of God's stuff and put it together, right? Because it's already there. Can you, can you speak it into existence? No. no. I mean, think about that. Like, let there be light. (laughs) How enormous God is in everything. It's it's like why the reason why Job is my favorite book, right? Job goes through the worst thing ever. He loses all of his kids, all of his family. Y'all, I mean, y'all know the story of Job. And then he gets the, the stupid friends that come up and try to tell him that he's unjust and there's the argument back and forth. And then at the end, God answers Job out of a cloud because Job finally has enough, right? Like, ah, what have I done? I haven't done nothing. And God calls out of the cloud and he says, he says, all right, Job, I'm going to ask you a couple questions, and you answer me. And he goes through listing this enormous creation. So God describes how, he says, were you there when I split the seas? Were you there when I hung the stars in the sky? Were you there when I did this? Were you there when I did that? Were you there when I just spoke it all into existence? And literally for like four chapters, he details creation and its enormity. And after Job hears it all, Job can't answer. He takes his hand and he puts it over his mouth. He says, I have no answer. You are so powerful. I could not understand this. How dare me? How dare me question your power, your knowledge, your presence. It's God is, God is, we're like this and, and, and no, we're like this. No, no, we're like this to God. We're not even an ant. We're, we're barely an atom to the enormity of God's power. And still, he loves us. Still, he comforts us. Can you, can you imagine that? I mean, do you ever really think about that? that? That he is all of that. And he says, I want to be your friend. You're my child. You're mine. I want you to be in my presence forever. You're a wretched human being, but I still love you. I knew you were going to be all that before you did it. And I'm going to take your hand and I'm going to walk you through this life so you can glorify me. So you can proclaim my name. So you can, you can go tell other people about me. So they can glorify my name. Understanding these attributes. Walking through these attributes. Studying these attributes. Makes you dwell on the goodness of God. 
makes you dwell. I mean, understanding that these omnis, they all interact. There's nothing, there's, there cannot be any kind of contradiction within the characters of God, right? That they all interact. His omniscience interacts with his love. His omniscience interacts with his wrath. His omniscience, he's all these things at the exact same time. The exact same time. And dwelling on these things, we can't even come close to comprehend. Like, my words are not making God very much. He's way more powerful than I can even speak. I could preach like Spurgeon and it still wouldn't come close. God is so good. I don't, I don't really have any other application in, in these things. And y'all know omni means all. And y'all know, at least I hope you know, that God is omnipresent. If you're saved, he's your friend and he's walking with you, holding your hand everywhere you go. He's omnipresent with you. He's omniscient. He knows even your thoughts. And to throw all that together, Romans 8, 28. He works all things together for the good of those who believe. And you know what you can do because he's omnipotent? You can trust that. You can rest in that. He can't lie. It's impossible. If God lied, he wouldn't be God. He says he's got you in his hand. And nothing can rip you out. Not even you. Dwell on these attributes. Study these attributes. Go through. If you're struggling with sin, go through and find the attributes of God. Go through and and read Psalm 139 because the whole thing is about the omnis of God. When when some of these these young people struggle in in things, I'll I'll, I'll get a call struggling through something. Uh, What's my first thing I say to you? All y'all tell me. What do I say? Every single one of y'all. Have you read your Bible yet? Have you read your Bible today yet? Have you started going through the Psalms that I've told you to start reading? Dwell on the Word of God, His attributes, and they will come to life in your face. It's real hard to sin when you know God is present with you. You know, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is... Breathed out by God and profit for teaching, for reproof, for correction, so that the man of God may be thoroughly, adequately equipped for every good work. Depends on the translation. Thank you. It's breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness for the man. (laughs) I love these kids. You read it and it brings you comfort, it brings reproof upon yourself. You can counsel yourself to these things, right? Know them, dwell on them, and you will get closer to God, studying his attributes, all right? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you again. Thank you for revealing these attributes to us through Scripture. For us to know that you're omniscient, that you're omnipresent, that you're omnipotent. Lord, I know it brings me comfort. It scares me when I sin. But at the same time, it brings me comfort. If we didn't have your revealed word, that, Lord, I cannot imagine life without that grace. without that evidence of your goodness, without that evidence of your mercy, how could we know you? Thank you for making yourself known through Jesus and your word. Lord, I pray that 
that if anyone here doesn't know you, I pray that the truth of the gospel pierces their heart today and whenever else it be your will. I pray that these people continue to study these words, these attributes, these characteristics of you as they go and live out their lives, Lord. And I I pray it motivates them to worship you in spirit and in truth. And I pray that it, it, it motivates them to go out and proclaim the good news even more. Like, how or why should we fear speaking to anyone if if we truly know that you are with us, if you are literally holding our hand and that, that it's not even on us to save anyone, it's just on us to go share it. Or, and why should we be scared? Because you're omnipotent. You're controlling the whole situation anyway. All we have to do is obey. I pray that that drives us to obey. I ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you all.